Welcome to uh, David Kelly's talk on Islamic philosophy, the good, the bad, and the dangerous. Ever since September of 2001, most of us in this room and many people around the world have been pursuing a crash course in understanding the Islamic world and its relations to the West. This, as we know, is an enormously complicated set of materials involving history, politics, religion, foreign policy, cultural level interactions, and many other aspects. One of the distinctive things about objectivism is its claim about the role of philosophy as fundamental to understanding all of that. And there's no one better place to uh, guide us through that material than uh, David Kelly. Of course, at this point in the week, David needs no introduction. Uh, so at this point, let's uh, turn things over to David. Uh, let's welcome David on Islamic philosophy. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. At the 1972 Olympic Games in Munich, nine Israeli athletes were killed in, a, in an attack mounted by Black September, a left-wing terrorist front for Arafat's Palestinian Liberation Organization. This year, if, heaven forbid, there is a terrorist incident at the Olympic Games in Athens, it is much more likely to be the work of, not of left-wing radicals, but of Islamic fundamentalists, groups such as Al-Qaeda. <clears throat> Over the last 30 years, the face of Islamic, uh, the, uh, the, I'm sorry, the face of terrorism has changed. Sacred terrorism, committed in the name of religious goals, has increased dramatically, while the left-wing groups using terror to pursue secular, nationalist, or Marxist goals has retreated. This is my first point on the outline. Currently, Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah are the most active and dangerous groups in the Middle East, all of them based on fundamentalist Islamic ideas. The latter's name, indeed, Hezbollah, Hezbollah, <clears throat> is an anglicization of Hezbollah, party of God. And meanwhile, as you see on this list, the Marxist and nationalist groups are considered to be of much lower risk. If we want to date this trend in the Middle East, 1979 is a pretty good year. It was in that year that the Islamic Revolution in Iran occurred under Khomeini, and that the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, which was the beginning of a jihad on the part of uh, many Islamic fundamentalists fighting the Soviets and thereby gaining training that has come back to affect many of us today. <clears throat> As we will see, though, the roots of sacred terror go back to the early decades of the 20th century, and the roots of those roots go back to the very beginnings of Islam. The religious character of Islamic terrorism is rooted in a set of doctrines that have been labeled Islamism, which can be defined briefly as the use of Islam, the religion of Islam, as a political ideology. The core themes <clears throat> can be seen in this comment from bin Laden himself in a statement that was aired on Al Jazeera earlier this year. The situation of all Arab countries, he says, suffers from great deterioration in all walks of life in religious and worldly matters. We have reached this miserable situation because many of us lack the correct and comprehensive understanding of the religion of Islam. Islam is not, he says, merely a matter of rituals. It is much more, it encompasses all of life political, military, social, moral, as well as spiritual. <clears throat> and, it is, <clears throat> me, and it is only by returning 
to the fundamentals of the religion, the religion as formulated in its early days, that we have any hope of restoring the glory that once was the Islamic civilization. <clears throat> Let's turn this into a set of theses for the sake of, of uh, a quick summary. The first is that Islam is to be defined by the literal interpretation of the Quran and the words and actions of Muhammad, known as Sunnah. This is the fundamentalist element. And the thesis that the Islamic world declined because Muslims became lax in their observance of Islam. As an ideology, it insists that Islamic moral and religious law be enforced, that it be the law of the land. In the face of a corrupt Western culture that breeds materialism, atheism, selfishness, and all the other unreligious sins. At the political level, Western influence in Islamic lands should be removed, as should the state of Israel. And all Muslims must unite to achieve this goal through jihad. <clears throat> now, Islamism is a wider phenomenon than terrorism. There are many people who subscribe to these doctrines who do not believe and certainly don't practice uh, terrorism as a means to achieving this. Yet, it is this view of the world that provides the intellectual source, the political motivation, and the recruiting ground for the small population who are terrorists. And so the question is, how did it arise? We can divide explanations roughly into three broad levels, political, religious, and philosophical. My concern here is with philo the philosophical, and I don't want to get into a extended debate during my talk, anyway, about uh, uh, to trying to show that the other um, dimensions are irrelevant. They certainly are not irrelevant. But let me just say a few words about each. Uh, the political explanation is that Islamism is a reaction to the Western presence in the Middle East. Through this, uh, the U.S. support of Israel, for example, subsidies to Egypt's military dictatorship and other authoritarian governments, friendly relations with Saudi Arabia, and so on and so forth. I think all that's a fact. I can't imagine uh, um, denying that out of court. However, we should remember that Islamism, or, or we will see, in the course of this lecture, that Islamism is a much older phenomenon than any of these. It goes back at least, it was fully formed as an ideology in the 1950s, uh, and its roots uh, are earlier than that, long before many of the things that we're talking about ever occurred. And I would add that uh, the is Islamists who uh, uh, feel themselves in deep opposition to Western culture would object to the intrusion of Western ideas through commerce and cultural penetration of the Islamic world, even if there were no military or other um, coercive sort of class. As for the religious explanation, some people say that the roots of Islamism are in Islam itself, that is, the religion itself in its dogmas breeds this outlook. They, turn to, they point to such things as the concept, uh, the element, uh, concepts that we find in the Quran, concepts uh, such as jihad, the use of the distinction between Dar al Islam and Dar al um, uh, Dar al, Dar al Harb, that is, the world of Islam and the world of unbelief, the world of war. Actually, Harb means war, I recall. Uh, it's, so it's the peaceful realm where it, 
uh, Islam rules and the rest of the world were at war with. <clears throat> and of course, there's the phenomenon of suicide bombers, which it, whose actions seem predicated on a belief in the Islamic afterlife. As confirmed in several cases, this is one, by the words of the, uh, the bombers themselves. This comes from an interview uh, that was uh, done by a New Yorker writer with a, uh, a, a bomber who made the effort. The bomb didn't go off. He got captured, spent time in jail, and tracked him down in Gaza and spoke with him about what he was doing. <clears throat> I might say, as a, as a uh, by the by, that I've heard many people making uh, reference to, usually uh, in a uh, uh, sarcastic mode, to the 72 virgins that uh, Muslims are promised in the afterlife if they get to heaven. <clears throat> and I've even, but I've even also heard people offer that as a serious kind of inducement for suicide bombing. Uh, I think that is, uh, uh, in a sense, demeaning, although I hate to say anything good about these nuts. But it's also really implausible. How likely is it that someone is going to kill himself because he has a better chance of you know, getting a date in the next world? This isn't like bar hopping. If we're going to attribute a religious motivation, it, we might as well attribute the ones that they, they invoke. So some people see bin Laden and his fellows as, uh, in fact, the truest expression of Islam. Uh, well, obviously, there is a religious motivation at work there. But on the one hand, if the specific dogmas of Islam as a religious creed were the key factor, the primary cause, which was the only one, one would expect to see a lot more fighting between the different sects of Islam, the Shiites and the Sunnis, who are divided by uh, subscribing to somewhat different dogmas. There is such fighting, but there is an awful lot of cooperation across uh, uh, those, those lines. And on the other hand, we should remember that the unquestioning belief in God and the afterlife and the bliss of eternity as a mot motivation is hardly unique to Islam. Leave out the words, the Quran and the Prophet, and there are adherents of other religions who could have said such a thing. Killing in the name of God is not unique to Islam. So we turn to the philosophical. I come to this issue with the assumption, the, 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 uh, I think backed by argument and uh, um, evidence, but it, for, for now it's an operating assumption that the philosophical ideas that are dominant, that reign in a society's culture, have a profound, important impact on that society, culture, and politics. Now, philosophical ideas may come from many sources. They may come from myth. They may come from uh, prophets. They may come from religious leaders, such as Buddha. But in, it, but in any culture that's sophisticated enough to have intellectuals who raise and debate ideas at this level, the content of these ideas, those philosophers often have a profound effect. They can and they do. Now, we are familiar with this from Western culture. I think most of us who have had some uh, education in the history of Western civilization, either in college or at um, the summer seminar, appreciate that there is a kind of narrative uh, of how we got where we are today in the big picture sense, how the Greek philosophers, Plato, such as Plato and Aristotle, were taken up and uh, affected the Christian eras by such thinkers as Augustine and Aquinas, how during the early modern period and the Enlightenment, thinkers like Descartes, Locke, 
Hume, Kant had, a, had an impact uh, in shaping the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, the birth of freedom, and how 19th century thinkers such as Hegel and Marx and Nietzsche have had a huge impact on our own world. Well, there's a similar story to be told about Islamic culture. Islam has a rich heritage of philosophical thought, comparable, in my view, comparable in depth and sophistication to Western philosophy, at least well into the, the, uh, the Middle Ages. And those, the philosophers of that era and the theologians who took up philosophical issues had a profound and lasting effect on Islamic society, an effect that lasts uh, down to our own period. The proof of this story is going to be in the telling. My goal in these lectures is to prevent an overview of the history of Islamic philosophy, focusing on the thinkers and the doctrines that are most relevant to contemporary Islamism. In many ways, it is a dramatic episode in intellectual history. And I'm going to present it to you as a drama in three acts. First, the classical age of Islamic philosophy in the 8th to the 12th centuries, the main trends and thinkers, and the impact on the Christian West. Secondly, the eclipse of Islamic philosophy in the period that followed, as advocates of reason were replaced by advocates of faith and force. And finally, the efforts at renewal, reform, and renaissance in Islamic culture by thinkers in the 19th and 20th centuries. I find this narrative interesting in its own right. I find it fascinating. Both in itself, it is kind of a philosopher's version of Thousand and One Nights, but also as an example of the broader impact that ideas can have. But over and above those intellectual values, I think the subject has, has an immediate and important practical value to understand where the Islamic terrorists are coming from and hopefully to understand what prospects there are for a different direction, a more liberal, rational, secular direction in that part of the world. So I invite you now to walk through the door and join me on this tour of some of these landmark thinkers. In the year 610, the Meccan merchant Muhammad ibn Abdullah, on a retreat that he was accustomed to making to a cave, was visited by the angel Gabriel, who told him that he was to be the messenger of God with a new message, not entirely new, but reformed from the Jewish and Christian prophets, and that he would be responsible for spreading this message in ever wider circles, ultimately to the world. As he was illiterate, others, he, uh, he, he told, the, told what the angel Gabriel had said to other people who wrote it down, and eventually these were compiled uh, into the document we now call the Quran. Quran means recitation. The angel was delivering the word of God in a literal sense. Muhammad and his followers were persecuted in Mecca. He fled to Medina in what is known as the Hijra in the year 622, which is the beginning uh, date of the Muslim calendar. But by 630, they had returned and conquered, uh, or not, they didn't have to fight. They took over um, Mecca again. And from that base, they unified the warring tribes of Arabia. And the Arabs, united under this new faith, began a rapid expansion of power. In the east, they attacked the two reigning empires, the Byzantines, who ruled the eastern part, uh, the eastern Mediterranean, including what is now Turkey, Egypt, and the Levant, Palestine, and the Persian Empire, Sassanid, that ruled Iran, Iraq, and uh, parts of Syria. In, in the east, the Byzantine Empire was pushed back to just the uh, area now called Turkey, or even only a part of that, 
east of the Taurus Mountains, which run up uh, along the northern Euphrates. And uh, in the west, the army swept across Egypt, swept to the Atlantic, and in uh, the year 711 crossed into Spain. Within about 100 years, a uh, little over 100 years uh, after Muhammad's death, Arab armies had actually invaded France, where they were defeated at Poitiers, the Battle of Tours, um, a mere, uh, not, not actually that far from uh, Paris, about 200 miles from Paris. And at the other end of the empire, thousands and thousands of miles away, they had defeated a Chinese army in the Terran Basin, north of the Himalayas. This remarkable campaign was conducted by rulers who succeeded Muhammad after his death in 732. These early caliphs <clears throat> um, were uh, followers, companions of the Prophet. Ali was the fourth. He was the, uh, uh, the cousin and also son-in-law of Muhammad. He was killed in a battle with uh, uh, the follower of Uthman after his death. And that led to the split, the historic split between Shiites and Sunnis. The caliphate was moved from Arabia up into the Middle East. Uh, the more populated areas in the Middle East first to Damascus, and then under a, a succeeding uh, dynasty to ba Baghdad. <clears throat> Now, these first four caliphs are, you know, unless you are particularly interested in this, there's no reason to remember their names. But I put them up there because they have a special significance in Islam. These, the first four, uh, are often known as the rightly guided caliphs. They've often been held up as models of Islamic rule. As I said, they were companions of Muhammad. They lived and fought with him. And they had all been singled out for leadership roles by Muhammad. They were, so to speak, his political religious heirs, and thus carried his endorsement. So from that time to this, they've been called the rightly guided caliphs. And uh, when contemporary Islamists refer to or return to the early community, uh, it is this kind of rule that they have in mind. Uh, the Abbasid Caliphate uh, replaced the, the direct successors of Muhammad um, in the year 750. They built Baghdad, which was called uh, uh, Madinat, Madinat al Salam, the city of peace, the ironic uh, name today. Now, two aspects of this early uh, um, religion uh, and the exercise of religion are, are important for us to bear in mind. One is the concept of the ummah, the community of, of uh, Muslims. Muhammad was a political as well as a religious leader. And in this respect, his genius was to integrate the tribal loyalties of Arabs, which had produced fierce internecine fighting in the Arabian Peninsula to combine them into a single community with the same, with a single shared sense of larger tribal identity. In other words, to tap the tribal motivation, but to expand it into a larger tribe. <clears throat> in uh, George Walsh's book, The Role of History and Religion, uh, George points out that, and this is a, this is a point he made and, and acquainted me with, Muhammad saw the tremendous energy the Arabs spent on bloody feuds, killing somebody whose great-grandfather had insulted one's own great-grandfather. If only this energy could be united into one force and diverted outward, it could be used for conquest. And I think that's part of the explanation for the extraordinary expansion. But this unity, felt unity of Muslims, has a more positive aspect, too. <clears throat> the solidarity is based in common faith, and it cuts across race and nationality. 
the Uma, U-M-M-A, the totality of believers regarded as a single community, is a concept that's comparable to Christendom in the West. But the felt unity is greater. It is invoked today not only by bin Laden, as we saw in his call for all Muslims everywhere to unite, but also in a more positive way by reformers who asked Muslims to remember their heritage and get beyond nationalism and um, any narrower form of tribalism. So, e pluribus unum, the umma, one community, many races and nationalities. The second concept is monotheism. The Quran, one of the what's that, uh, repeated phrases in the Quran and uh, parts of prayers is la ilala ila Allah. There is no God but Allah. In proselytizing for his vision, Muhammad's chief enemies were polytheists in Mecca. And so the insistence on monotheism was a particularly important uh, role in Islam. And the belief in God's unity and exclusive claim on our worship is frequently embodied in decorative motifs, such as this one, it's la ila la ila Allah, uh, on the gate of a city. It is also commonly invoked uh, implicitly in accusations of polytheism, which are slung around not only toward people who believe in uh, you know, the equivalent, the Middle Eastern equivalent of Druids, or, um, and not just Christians who believe in a tripartite God, which is polytheism, but even fellow Muslims who give too much attention in worship to sacred places, saints, and so forth. Well, we'll see that returning. Okay. In the western reaches of the conquest, the Arabs did not encounter highly civilized peoples. They, uh, the Berbers of North Africa did not have a language. The Visigoths of Spain didn't, um, were fairly, uh, uh, were not a center of learning. But in the Middle Eastern um, area, they encountered highly developed and civilized uh, communities. Uh, civilizations, Persian, Indian, and then of course Greek and Roman. And at the same time, uh, the Christians who ruled from Byzantine had reached the point of fanatic religious dogmatism and were closing down on secular thought the remains of, of Greek philosophy. They burned libraries, They attacked thinkers. Uh, Hypatia was a famous mathematician and philosopher in Alexandria, not a Christian. Um, he was killed by a Christian mob that was excited by some obscure debate over theology or, or, or whatnot. Byzantine never closed the school of philosophy in Athens. Many of the philosophers migrated east to, to Persia. And so when the Arabs invaded this area, they found people who had been alienated from Christianity. And many of them welcomed the Arabs. And the Arabs, for their part, were eager to assimilate Greek culture. Translations uh, into Arabic were supported by many of the caliphs. The uh, Abbasid um, caliph al-Mamun, created in Baghdad, what was called the House of Wisdom, were collecting manuscripts, engaging in translations. They hired translators to translate from Greek and Syriac and other languages into Arabic. They um, engaged in, uh, it, the House of Wisdom had an astronomical observatory. By around the year 900, virtually all of Greek learning had been translated into Arabic, including Euclid, uh, uh, medical texts, Hippocrates and others, Ptolemy's astronomy, and the works of Plato and Aristotle. And this initiated what is a golden age, really, of Islamic civilization. It included advances in science, this is a painting of, a, of an observatory, and it was fostered by an attitude of openness, curiosity, and the lack of a not invented here attitude. Al-Kindi, often called the first philosopher of Islam, uh, justified his 
views of Aristotle and other Greek philosophers in this way, saying truth is truth, whoever discovers it. In the course of all of this, the, uh, this development, there came to be three different approaches to understanding what Islam meant. Law, theology, and philosophy. You're following your outline, and see doing that first, and I will come to the theologians in a moment. I don't want to talk too much about law right now. Uh, and in fact, I would say just this. Law in, as it evolved in Islamic culture, pertains to the practical implications of the, of the, uh, of the Quran, the practical <coughs> implications in terms of personal behavior and social relationship. The content of what God has commanded and what it means to live as a Muslim is the Sharia, the term I'm sure many of you have heard. But the, the Sharia consists of laws, not all of which are written down or available in written form. It means the totality of what God has commanded and what you must do. And that, a lot of that has to be figured out through a process of inquiry. The term fiqh is the Arabic word. It means jurisprudence. But uh, it's significant because the sources of this mode of reasoning were tightly tied to the Quran, to the three, uh, and the words and actions of Muhammad. Theology was one step removed from, from all of this. It was still took the religious, basic religious dogmas for granted, but it engaged in the effort through um, hypothesis, explanation, uh, imaginative uh, uses of the mind to try to make the religion coherent, intellectually coherent. So it starts with dogma, provides, works out the reasons for supporting them as true and for attacking adherence of rival dogma. Whereas philosophy, is the inquiry into the world without the assumption of religious dogma, without taking those as axioms. In fact, all the philosophers were Muslims or did believe in uh, most of the core doctrines, although not all, as we'll see. And that got them into trouble. In theology, which emerged really before uh, philosophy, the key doctrine was or the, or the key dispute which emerged very early on <clears throat> was between two schools of thought called Metazolites and Asherites. I'm giving you the, the Arabic names because these terms are still alive, often referred to, invoked as a point of reference by thinkers today. The first controversy that divided them was between free will and determinism. The Metazolites, who were more worldly, more inclined toward reason, held that man has free will. How else can we be held responsible by God for what we do? Judgment day makes no sense unless we have some choice in the matter. Whereas your opponents, the Asherites, argued that to believe that man has free will is to take away from God's power. It is a kind of polytheism because it's ascribing an independent source of action to something other than God. Aligned with this issue was the question of how we know the moral law. The Metazolites gravitated toward the view that the moral law is objective, it's out there, we can understand it by reason. Some of them went so far as to say even God is bound by the moral law. Whereas their opponents held that the moral law is established by God's command, which can only be known through revelation. Al-Asher, the founder of the Asherite school, um, said, nothing is good or evil on earth except what God has willed. 
So how are we going to gain salvation now? The Metazolites, believing that we have control of our action and that we can know the moral law, held that we gain salvation through our actions, whereas their opponents held that they, uh, we gain it by faith, by giving ourselves to God and hoping for the best. Now, since Islam is founded on a sacred text, the question arises, how are we to understand that text? The Mutazilites said, look, there's a lot of metaphorical stuff here in the Quran. It needs interpretation. We have to spell it out and put it in literal terms. Whereas their opponents said, no, the Quran is the recitation of God's word. It is God's word. You know what he said? There's a famous uh, uh, dispute, one of those disputes that becomes a cultural icon, over uh, the references to God's throne in the Quran. There are many verses that uh, refer to God's throne, such as these. Well, the throne is a physical thing. And if you think about it, does God actually ascend and then sit in the throne? How do you do that if you're not physical, if you're a purely spiritual being? Not to mention that that's an action. And how do you do that? How do you engage in action if you're an eternal, unchanging being? So this caused a problem. And there's a famous story about uh, um, a judge named Malik. He was actually the founder of one of the four schools of Islamic law. The story, a man came to ask him, the merciful is established over the throne. How is that? It was puzzling. Don't ask. Please, please notice here the word innovation. It is not a positive term in this context. It is indeed a term of accusation and abuse. We will see it again and again. Now, so far, each of these issues are exactly parallel. In fact, they are the same issues that arose in Christianity and almost have to arise in any monotheistic religion. But there was another issue that arose um, due to the special nature of Islam, and that was the status of the Quran. I said the Quran is a recitation of God, unlike the Bible, which is a report by humans of what God told them and of stories about what the Israelis did and what Jesus did and the, prophet and the apostles and so forth. The Quran is God speaking. Muhammad is just taking dictation. So now we have another puzzle comparable to the throne. Was God there in that mountain outside Mecca speaking? Is, if the Quran is God's word, God's eternal, so is the Quran eternal? Even if we say, okay, the books aren't eternal, and any one recitation uh, by a human being is, you know, of the moment, still the words, was God speaking and thinking in Arabic? Was it thought rolling through his head? So the Metazolites held that the Quran was created. It is uh, something created in time as a record of something much more fundamental, uh, an eternal thought in God's mind. But their opponents, the Asherites, claim that the Quran is eternal. Now this really, really obscure issue became, is important historically because uh, uh, the caliph, the same caliph, Mamun, who founded the House of Wisdom, made the Metazolite doctrine on this point required. He threw uh, the opponents, the Asherites, in jail. And so that when he left and a more orthodox caliph came in, uh, the Metazolites were thrown in jail and the Hanbalites were, uh, the Hanbal, Hanbal was the uh, key figure. He's been a founder of another school of law. He, he thought that the Quran is eternal. Uh, and this was a kind of a, uh, a tipping point against the Metazolites. Uh, they were, uh, they gradually disappeared from uh, Islamic theology in terms of a school of thought, although the idea and the reference point still remains. But meanwhile, the philosophers had 
undertaken their work. I'm going to talk briefly about three philosophers who are probably the most prominent and important philosophers in the history of Islam in any case, but they are uh, particularly important for our story. Ibn Sina, and I'm going to have to be, I'm sorry, Avicenna, I will have to be brief here, was a Persian philosopher, a prodigy. I'll tell just one little story. He, uh, after having mastered the, the, memorized the Quran at age 10, learned uh, Euclid's geometry, uh, and so on and so forth, he was reading Aristotle's uh, metaphysics and found that more difficult than anything he'd done. And even after 40 readings, he said, I still, uh, he had basically, basically memorized it, he still didn't quite understand it. And he was 17 or 18 before he got it. <laughs> <laughs> philosophy, philosophy students take note. <laughs> What he did was to try to take the Aristotelian theme of uh, this worldly philosophy and merge enough of the Islamic monotheistic view into it. In that respect, he was siding with Aristotle rather than, than Plato. The philosophies that they inherited, I'll just give you a capsule summary of the Platonic view is of two worlds, this world in which we're immersed with our bodies and grasped through our senses, and a higher world, the forms that we grasp through our intellect, in which our soul yearns to free itself from the body and return to it. Aristotle saw not a dichotomy between two worlds, this world and the other world, but this world was the world. It was uh, made of things that had natural identities which we understand through reason and intellect, and in which we live as integrated beings of mind and body. We're not bifurcated. Neither the world nor man is bifurcated in that way. Avicenna, like many other philosophers, picked up on one theme of Aristotle, which is that nature is organized into ever more complex forms. Matter is organized, shaped, structured by ever more complex identities from mud stones, to plants, to animals, to human beings. Avicenna uh, was of uh, a school of thought that said, well, let's just take that great chain of being and keep on going until we reach God as the most perfect, the highest level, the pure form, the purely spiritual form, who's not categorically different from the world. I mean, we can understand him. Uh, not as something utterly alien and bifurcated, but as the top of a chain which stretches down continuously through various intermediary bodies, uh, supernatural bodies, down to man, down, and so on and so forth, the great chain of being. It's an idea that would become very popular in Christianity later. Um, <clears throat> the key points, then, of his philosophy are that uh, reality exists as this continuum of, of being. He held that God is the creator of the world, but not in the sense that at one point in time he said, let there be light, and there was light, and then all the rest, but rather that he is the eternal sustainer of the world, <clears throat> which means that the world is eternal. Think about that. The world is eternal. And within the world, things act in accordance with their natures, as Aristotle had said. We know those natures by reason. Prophecy, revelation, is a shortcut that is vouchsafed to some people, but it's just a shortcut. Uh, it adds to our knowledge in some ways, but it's really not in, it, and it takes precedence to break the conflict. But it, uh, reason will get the philosopher there uh, most times. And finally, that God being this perfect, pure intellect, kind of, all he has is concepts. He doesn't perceive the world. He doesn't engage with it. As Mike Tazalai said, he doesn't, he wasn't literally there talking to Muhammad in real time. 
he interacts with the world by sustaining the world as such, but within the world then things take their, their course. <clears throat> This was a viewpoint that the next philosopher took after with a vengeance. Ghazali was born uh, about three generations after Avicenna, also a brilliant thinker, a prodigy. At the age of 37, he was teaching in Baghdad, very prominent, lecturing, writing, when he had some kind of spiritual crisis. That led him, he said in an autobiographical work, to feel that his learning and his intellectual work were all show, that they were unimportant and contributed nothing to the attainment of eternal life. So he left his position, he wandered for many years as a Sufi, mystic, a mystic um, trying to learn the ways of the uh, Sufis back to the, uh, the mystical uh, sect. Returned to his home and after 11 years or so began teaching again and writing voluminously works of ethics, spirituality, and so forth, but also attacks on the philosopher. Because he was, and always remained, an Asherite theologian. He believed in that list of doctrines that I laid out. He was steeped in Islamic law, and he thought that philosophy and even theology were extremely dangerous. As a philosopher, he uh, took as his, in his explanation, he said, I started when I was reading philosoph philosophers as a, trying to figure out what I believe. My standard was I'm looking for certainty. I'm looking for certainty so full and complete that it, that it represents infallibility. I will look for any aspect of what I know that could not possibly be wrong. That's what Descartes would do many centuries later. The senses are infallible, he said. We experience illusions. Our total knowledge of nature, our scientific knowledge, could be wrong. We could be dreaming. And even our intellectual grasp of the truths of logic and mathematics isn't infallible. Because after all, we can imagine a higher faculty of knowledge. We can conceive a higher faculty of knowledge which would it let us know that the truth that what we grasp and seem so secure as axioms and self-evident propositions is just as shaky as our intellect knows our senses to be. We can imagine that, so we can conceive it so it's not infallible. <clears throat> His most famous work was called The Incoherence of the Philosophers. in which he tried to prove that the works of the philosophers like Avicenna were contradictory or at least unproven. And his chief target was Avicenna, whom he recognized rightly as the most accomplished, the most powerful thinker of, among the philosophers he wanted to attack. This work, it's um, very difficult to underestimate the importance of this work, the incoherence of the philosophers. For one thing, it is intellectually brilliant. It is powerful and subtle in argument, and it created the sense that the philosophers had been wiped out with their own weapons. <clears throat> that they'd been out-argued by their own methods. That they'd been shown up as false witnesses to, to the truth by this intense relentless cross-examination so that we, the popular jury, can dismiss what they said. That's one reason Ghazali had such an impact. Second reason is that he raised the flag of orthodoxy. I mentioned that he belonged to the school of uh, Asherite theology. He was a scholar of the law. He felt that the free exercise of reason in philosophy encouraged people to wander astray from Islam. Even theology, he thought, was pretty risky. Theology, he said, should not be practiced by those whose faith might be troubled by it, nor should it be used to build the structure of thought 
which goes beyond what is given in the Quran and the Hadith. The Hadith are the reports of, of uh, Muhammad, which were a source of evidence for what uh, Islam requires. Theology said as a matter only to specialists, like the Soviet intellectual elite. Only when they were really trustworthy could be, they be allowed to study American documents. <clears throat> In the influence of philosophy, uh, it is structured as, as an examination and, and refutation of 20 theses that philosophers like Avicenna had asserted. Of those 20, he said, 17 were mere heresies, incompatible with uh, orthodox philosophy. But three were worse. <laughs> this comes from the conclusion of the book where he says that to brand the philosophers with infidelity as far as these three issues, their positions on these three issues, is inevitable. The belief in the eternity of the world. If you believe that, you're not a Muslim. You're an apostate. If you believe that God knows the world only abstractly and is not, does not engage in special providence and special um, concern, particular concern for individuals, you are an apostate. The third one, the resurrection of lives, I couldn't get into. It's an interesting issue. I'm not sure I have a general belief in that. Some philosophers actually deny, did deny, though, that, uh, that, that the person, body and soul, was resurrected. That was orthodox opinion. Now, this is a serious thing to say because the standard penalty for apostasy was death. Okay? If you were born Muslim, if you were practicing Muslim and left the religion, that was penalty. That's apostasy. If you were born Christian or Jewish, you were generally tolerated. Uh, that was a different matter. Of special importance in, um, in the uh, incoherence of uh, philosophy was another proposition in which Ghazali attacked the idea that nature works by causal law, that there is an order of necessary connections between cause and effect in the world that we can understand. Remember the debate between the Metazolites and the Asherites over free will and determinism. That expanded into a debate where people who took the human free will side and were prepared to believe that being created beings in nature could initiate action, extended that more broadly to say all things. They don't have free will, but they act on their own, just as Aristotle said. They have a nature and they act accordingly. The Asherites said polytheism, the only agent through all of nature is God. That is all it can be. <clears throat> so there is no literal causality, causal necessary connection between cause and effect. God makes everything happen, moment by moment. Some, uh, I think it was in this um, school of thought, the Asherites, thought that actually the world consists of atoms, that God creates each moment. They last a moment, then he recreates them, each time assigning whatever properties to them he wants. And it's sort of like a computer screen being refreshed constantly. Okay. Where there's no relationship between what's happening on one pixel and what's happening on another moment by moment. It's all in the hands of the capital P programmer. Now, Ghazali may not have gone that far, but he's the one who denied him, uh, that there was uh, causal necessity in nature. And he put forward a whole set of arguments that uh, are, are extremely close to the arguments that David Hume would make famous 600, 600 years later. There's no country. He says, we can imagine, we put fire burns cotton, but we can imagine fire having a different effect. And imagination is one test to what happens. We don't observe the connections, he says. We just see the fire, we see the cotton, but we don't observe any connection between them. And he formulated the hypothesis that 
the reason we believe there's some kind of connection that the fire has to burn the coffin is that we're, God has arranged it so that it usually happens. And we form the habit or expectation so that we have a psychological propensity to, to expect the burning. And we project that out onto the object themselves so it isn't there. If you've read Hume or followed Hume, um, you will see the parallels. I want to end with the third thinker in our list. The thinker known as uh, Averroes. He was lived in Spain, Andalusia, the name for the area of Spain and, and northern Africa that the uh, Muslims controlled. This was somewhat independent of the eastern portion of Islam under a series of caliphs, ironically, uh, dynasties that had begun as fundamentalist movements but a generation or two in, in, in both cases that were uh, relevant to Averroes, they had become much more liberal and incur specifically encouraged um, intellectual work. Averroes was a judge, he was uh, a physician, but he was also a philosopher and is known best uh, as a commentator on Aristotle. What he did here is, is enormously significant. Aristotle had been translated into Arabic. There were many translations. But er, a lot of earlier translators, whether they were Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, had tended to incorporate some of their own religious assumptions into the translation. And some of them weren't very good philosophically. And so they just didn't understand what Aristotle was trying to say, which, believe me, is not easy. And garbled stuff. So he undertook this vast 30-year-long project of commenting on every text, cleaning up the text, uh, and presenting Aristotle in as close as possible to Aristotle's own words, and then he would uh, add commentaries on what he thought the words meant. He was uh, brilliant at this, and it had a huge impact uh, on the West. But he was also a philosopher in his own right. He wrote a book called The Incoherence of the Incoherence, Attacking Ghazali, <laughs> <laughs> trying to show, among other things, is, I, guess, I think this is where the title comes from, that there is something incoherent about using the tools of reason to undermine the exercise of reason. But more specifically, he undertook to deal with the uh, specific, uh, to defend some of the claims that Ghazali had attacked. He held that the world exists eternally, that it has a causal order. He did hold that human beings are determined. He did not subscribe to free will. But he thought our actions are determined by natural causes, by psychological internal factors as well as external ones, not by God's intervention in our lives. And in all three of these ways, he took what many earlier thinkers like Avicenna had, had believed, wanted to believe, and was more rigorous, more ruthless in defending uh, and explaining them. But the thing that is most important about him is the final point, that when, that there can't be a clash between reason and revelation, because reason, in a sense, is always in the driver's seat. If anything in the Quran seems to conflict with the conclusions reached by reason, such conflict must be only apparent. If philosophy and scripture disagree on the existence of anything, he said, the scripture must be interpreted allegorically. Now that's a doctrine with radical implications, even though it doesn't challenge the truth of what's said in the Quran uh, in some fundamental sense. He was not denying the religion. Indeed, as a judge, he was often enforcing it. But because he believed that the Quran was largely metaphorical, designed to communicate the truth in picturesque language to people who couldn't get it in pure rational form, he could hold that philosophers and scientists, for that matter, should follow their reason and, uh, and in the confidence that they weren't going to run afoul of true Islam. And of course, a statement from Frederick Koppelstein in the history of philosophy on the significance of, um, of this in 
what was always a core debate in Islam as well as Christianity. How do we square philosophy and theology? Everos had the protection of the rulers in Andalusia, who were becoming more liberal during this period, turning away from the fundamentalism of their founding, the founder of their dynasty. But this seems to have generated resistance from the conservative clerics. They agitated and enrolled all kinds of uh, you know, popular uh, support for more orthodoxy. The caliph finally bowed to the pressure. Averroes was exiled to a small village. His writings were banned. His books were burned in Cordoba. He died shortly thereafter. So this was not good news for philosophy. At this point in our story, philosophy is under intellectual assault in the eastern part of the Islamic world, branded as incoherent and heretical uh, 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 and uh, an exercise in apostasy. And the greatest philosopher in the western part of the world had had his books burned. So the prospects were not looking good. We will pick up the story here next, in the next lecture. All right. Let us pick up the story where we began, where we left off, rather, yesterday. We talked about the origins of the, of the religion and as defined by the Quran and by the Sunnah, the words and actions of Muhammad. We talked about the input of the Greek philosophers and scientists. And then the three disciplines, the three modes of knowledge that the Muslim thinkers developed law, which was based on almost exclusively on the Quran and the Sunnah, theology, which was drawn from the religious content but informed by Greek philosophy and science, and philosophy per se, where the thinkers grew, uh, although they were Muslim, their, their theories were developed uh, out of Greek philosophy and science, and of course with their own originality. Now let us move on to uh, the a brief excursion into the impact of some of these ideas in the West. You recall that that uh, Averroes' works were banned, burned briefly. He was brought back into favor, but it was too little, too late. But in the Christian West, Europe at this time was awakening from its own long, dark ages of backwardness, during which it was uh, both economically and culturally impoverished. And the, the uh, works of Averroes and other Muslim philosophers were to have a large, uh, very significant impact. impact. In the Spanish city of Toledo, which at this point had been retaken by the Christian army, scholars uh, were, monks mainly, were busy accumulating manuscripts of the Arab philosophers, including Arabic translations of Aristotle's original works in the Greek, and they were translating them into Latin. What you see here is the uh, cathedral at Toledo. This is not actually the cathedral at this time. This is a later uh, work, but you get the idea. This is also happening in Italy and several other places. During the lifetime of Averroes, the ideas in the broad translation project were beginning to have an impact throughout Europe. Averroes' works, you recall, were condemned and banned in Cordoba, Muslim Cordoba, in the year 1195. Copies were uh, available uh, in Toledo, though, and by the 1220s, a mere 25, 30 years later, Latin translations of, Ver of, of Averroes' <clears throat> uh, works, particularly his commentaries on Aristotle, which, as you recall, I, I explained were cleaned up versions of Aristotle, plus his own commentary, were circulating in Paris and Oxford at the universities, along with the works of many other Muslim thinkers, and thanks to the Muslims, 
uh, of Aristotle himself. Now this was a shock to the Christian world that was in some ways even greater than the shock of, of the Greeks had been to the Muslims because they did not have anything that was fully developed that theory uh, of their own. And the Christians, for their part, already knew a little about Aristotle because they had his logical work. So he had taught them how to think and uh, for the sake of their dis disputations. And here was this um, uh, teacher of method, and suddenly it's revealed that he has this comprehensive worldview that is radically at odds with Christianity. He dis they discovered that this thinker they already had to respect believed in a secular world, a scientific love of nature, a man-centered view of life, and an idea of happiness as the ultimate goal in life, happiness, not salvation. Thomas Aquinas was the thinker who put this together with Christianity in the most powerful way. And in that respect, uh, he certainly deserves our gratitude. Uh, as someone who, uh, in effect, created a shelter within Christianity for reason, inquiry, and some degree of independent thought which then evolved on their own and uh, uh, the process of investigation and the pursuit of reason once started uh, could never be stopped. But Aquinas was, on, in many respects, rather conservative. He was a Christian thinker. He did limit reason in certain ways in the name of revelation. He was less thoroughly committed, in a sense, to the Aristotelian perspective than I would I would say, than he was a Averroes. Indeed, Aquinas wrote works of criticizing Averroes. But other Christian thinkers were more radical. They do not come down to us uh, um, in history. Uh, the, the works that come down to us are not all that impressive philosophically. But they created a movement known as uh, Latin Averroism. Averroism. Uh, which, along with Aquinas' work, um, were the church was very concerned about. It banned a number of, uh, like 219 propositions um, in one edict, um, many of which were uh, the um, uh, on matters such as the eternity of the world, which the Latin Navarro was believed in, and that was heresy. But the main impact of, of these thinkers was to create the cultural agenda of independent reason. They did say that reason is to be followed. It sets the terms. Theology is the handmaiden of philosophy. And this was uh, 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 an enormously exciting idea. And it had, uh, it, it became, uh, Averroism was almost more a broad cultural phenomenon taken up by people like Dante. In the Divine Comedy, Dante was uh, contemporaneous with many of the, Latin, uh, the Christian uh, philosophers, the author of the great, great work of literature, the Divine Comedy. Dante was a big fan of Averroes. In the Divine Comedy, you know, there's hell, there's limbo, and there's paradise. Muhammad was in hell, but Averroes, along with Avicenna, was in limbo. They couldn't be in paradise because they were Christians. But he did put some of the Latin Averroists, <laughs> who were Christians, into paradise. In Raphael's School of Athens, the famous painting of Greek philosophy, um, one of the um, uh, iconic works uh, of, of uh, the Italian, I, I guess that was the early Renaissance. It's what you see here are all the Greek philosophers and some moderns. Um, some people think that uh, Raphael painted himself in Greek history. But notice over here, we have this interesting figure. Averroes is the one philosopher who was not Greek, he was Muslim, not Greek or Christian, he was Muslim who got into the picture. Okay, from 
at that point forward, Western history can take care of itself. We know the outcome. There was a reformation. There was an enlightenment. There was the industrial revolution. And now there's us. So I want to get back to the story of uh, the Islamic world. And the long period of eclipse in philosophy and science, for that matter, in that part of the world. <clears throat> part of the reason for this eclipse was uh, a political turmoil. There was the Crusades, First Crusade, in which parts, regions, uh, small states in the Levant were captured. Uh, there was a capture of Jerusalem itself. <clears throat> Later, the um, um, great Islamic um, general Saladin and, and, and uh, Sultan uh, battled the Christian forces and retook Jerusalem. And then the Mongols arrived. Fortunately, most of Europe was spared, but uh, the largest part of the Middle East was, was uh, invaded. Baghdad was sacked with uh, a huge loss of life. The city was destroyed and really didn't um, come back until the 20th century. But the eclipse of philosophy had philosophical roots. The ideas of Averroes were rejected and vilified when they were mentioned at all, and they largely were not mentioned. Al-Ghazali had won. I'm sorry, I, I, let me fast forward. Uh, the last political point is that finally the Ottomans uh, acquired their empire and some stability was returned. And in the East, the, there were various Persian um, uh, empires. Al-Ghazali had won the philosophical uh, debate, at least in terms of influence. And this is a commonly shared opinion uh, throughout uh, the scholars I know. It's uh, everything like this is, can be controversial. <clears throat> But I rely on scholars who know this uh, this history, intellectual history, better than I um, do or probably ever will. Uh, this is from um, a work of a uh, you know, Pakistani scholar who pointed out simply that Ghazali was and is the iconic philosophical spiritual thinker. known all over. <clears throat> and it was not simply the broad-based influence. It was a specific kind of synthesis that he put together of mysticism as an internal practice, a way of personally practicing the religion, and law, conformity with law, in terms of external behavior. So what's ruled out of this is the guidance of thought, knowledge, and your spiritual life by reason, and the guidance of your behavior, your practice, by reason. <clears throat> I want to say a word about both wings of that, because they were um, in constant interplay and intertwining for the next centuries. On the side of law, the most significant thinker for our purposes was Ibn Taymiyyah. He was a Syrian. He was a legal scholar. He belonged to the Hanbalite school of law. Remember, we touched briefly on the, uh, the development of law. There were four schools. They were all created in the first centuries after Muhammad, and they are still the four schools to which, if you're a Muslim, you um, presumably belong. These schools are that have, have these names. The names are not that significant, but they're, I've, they're ranked there in order of from most liberal to most conservative. Most liberal allows personal assessment and judgment, but liberal does not even allow consensus of experts. It, the Hanbalites believe, they were named after Hanbal. You may remember we mentioned Hanbal. He was the one who got locked up by the caliph who was an Abbasite, um, and uh, because he believed that the Quran was eternal, and then he got even because change of regime, uh, 
<clears throat> as in Washington, he moved from out of office into a uh, <laughs> position of power. And uh, but anyway, for the Hanbalites, it was just the Quran and just the Prophet Muhammad. That all everything had to be traced back. All laws had to be traced back that far. It was not even analogy. The exercise of reason by analogy. So. Uh, forward. All right. In addition to his, uh, he was a strict conservative fundamentalist. <clears throat> he engaged, however, he was uh, enormous, uh, enormously prolific, uh, writing constantly these polemics against the philosophy. He attacked all the philosophers. He wrote particularly savage attacks on uh, uh, Ibn Rushd, uh, um, Averroes. And he wrote works attacking the syllogism and definition as, as unreliable instruments of reasoning. But even theology was too much for him. It was too speculative. And he uh, went after al-Ghazali as well. One particular, particularly significant point for our story about him is that he introduced the idea of jihad, religious war, against fellow Muslims. Muslims have been fighting each other for centuries, but the idea of jihad is that's what you direct to the, to the infidel world, the Dar al the, uh, uh But here were the Mongols. They were invading. He wanted, they had become Muslim by this time. So they couldn't, he, he wanted to rouse the, the, the Arabs to fight them with religious fervor but they were Muslim. So he thought, well, okay, but they're not pure Muslim. What they practice is this mix of Islam. Yeah, they bought into it, but they've also bringing in these, you know, Mongolian habits they had back um, two generations before under Genghis Khan. And they, um, uh, so they're not pure, which means they're not purely Muslim and were entitled to wage jihad internally, so to speak. Come back to that. <clears throat> this was an innovation, to use a term he would have hated. The other main trend in Islamic uh, thought and culture at this was mysticism. As I said, that's the other wing of these intertwining uh, trends. Speculative thought continued, particularly in the eastern portions in Persia, which had had its long you know, independent tradition. But it was, it was all of a, of a mystical variety. Uh, one Persian philosopher who stands out, he was somewhat innovative, um, was Mullah Sadra, uh, who lived several centuries uh, in, the, in the 1500s. And I mention him uh, only because he worked in this in the um, uh, in Isfahan, in Qum, the very schools and centers of learning that um, Ayatollah Khomeini came out of. And he was steeped in that way of thinking. But instead of, I, I don't want to go into all the mystical doctrine, but again, let me try to convey something of what it meant um, in cultural terms and specifically in artistic terms. The themes of the mystics were, the familiar ones, uh, uh, if you have, have read anything in mystical traditions, and I am using the word mystical here in its specific historical sense, not to mean any anti-rational uh, uh, exercise, uh, as Nathaniel yesterday was pointing out, and sometimes did, uh, but in the narrow sense of personal spiritual experience that is held to be, believed to be, uh, an awareness of things beyond this world, unattainable by your human senses. But the themes are pretty common. There's the infinite nature of God, the utter transcendence of God as something beyond anything we can experience with our senses or understand with our minds. There is the sense of uh, the insubstantiality of the world, that when we, when we grasp the, the nature of the other world, when we even enter into uh, any kind of, of insider revelation from God, the whole world, we begin to see the whole world as 
on the air shimmering a reflection in appearance. It is a theme of esoteric knowledge, knowledge not given to people, knowledge that lies buried in the secret meanings of texts like the Quran. And there is always the notion of illumination, of being illuminated by God's will. In fact, some of the mystics held reality is just light. And so we see this reflected in many ways. Here's the light motif uh, in Islam as in Christianity. Much was made of light as a symbol of, of heaven and heavily, heavenly irradiation of the world. This is from the mausoleum. Uh, great efforts were made architecturally to uh, structure the light and make it uh, a resting, to make it a, a play on uh, uh, take over one, one's senses. Also, there was a spatial motif <clears throat> that was very, very common, a decorative motif. Uh, we've, we've all seen the pattern tiles and the pattern rugs and, and all of this that are a pervasive part of decorative art. Uh, and they are the equivalent, I'm not going to argue philosophically whether they count as art but they're, because they're non-representational, but representation wasn't allowed. Uh, it's not allowed partly by means of dogma, but here is a, I thought a, a thoughtful comment on uh, on what it, on why it is. The point of art is to is to give us a sense of God's being, his, uh, which means specifically His infinity, and we can do that in part by designs that have intricate structure that convey, in effect, infinite unfolding as you look into them. Uh, it, this is not mysterious. We've all seen this. If you've ever been uh, around any kind of tile work or anything like that, I, just to give you a quick example that I'm um, ready to hand. Um, <clears throat> if you, you see how the, what looks like a certain design varied. It's it just every time you bring it out, it's like um, uh, fractals. Is the idea in, in modern terms. At this time, uh, too, what were the scholars doing? Bernard Lewis uh, pointed out that uh, there were no. Apparently, I mean, he knows everything. <clears throat> about the Turkish, Arabic, and Persian world. And he says flat out, we know of no Muslim scholar or man of letters before the 18th century, 1700, who sought to learn the Western language, much less to produce grammars and translations and, and all of this. Now, think of what's happening in Europe. This explosion, by, by the 1700s, we are well into the Enlightenment. And it was not simply a, a, a resistance to it, it was, as far as we can tell, pretty much blank ignorance of it. One of the astounding things to me is that the works of the, of the uh, European thinkers, philosophers, were not translated back from Latin into Arabic as they began to do original philosophical work. I mean, here we have uh, thinkers in Europe who were desperate and drank in every piece of text they could find and then took it and produced this scholastic philosophy and then out of that um, early modern philosophy. But none of that got translated back into Arabic. <clears throat> I'm not sure when it did, um, but uh, uh, it certainly was not before the, the uh, late, in, late in this period. Um, it may well have been in, into the 19th century. There was a complete um, cultural isolation. So let us move on to the 19th and 20th centuries when the Islamic world encountered the West partly through uh, trade, partly through the Western um, invasions 
political control, and partly through some awakening of learning. <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, several movements or nodal points that went into this. First, at the very beginning of this period, there was the, the Wahhabi movement. I'm sure most of many of you have read about this because Wahhabism is still the uh, uh, orthodox doctrine in Saudi Arabia. It was started by Muhammad ibn Abd, uh, Abd al Wahhab, who was a, uh, actually a very well educated um, man uh, in, um, in Saudi Arabia, he lived in the 18th century. He was a fundamentalist. He subscribed to the Hanbalite theory of law that is a strictly uh, most limited one. And he launched a movement that uh, one of the recurrent patterns of, of fundamentalist reform movements, in which the central concept, the thing that, that really was the focus of Wahhabism, was the idea of strict monotheism versus anything that even smells of polytheism, which they denounced as shirk, which is a sin. Um, the act of putting co-equals to Allah in any form, and not just other gods, you know, not just uh, you know Apollo and Jupiter and and that kind of uh, uh, garden variety polytheism, but as we were talking about last time, elevating anything to anything to a position remotely similar to um, importance as an object of worship. And this is the most dangerous of all sins. He said the wickedest and most severely punished because it denigrates the Almighty. And he launched a crusade, he founded a band uh, called the, the Ikhwan, the Brotherhood, that uh, were sort of marauded and uh, attacked into Iraq, uh, all through Saudi Arabia, trying to enforce their will, and formed an alliance with the, the Saud tribe, <laughs> who began gaining control. And although that didn't stick completely. The pattern repeated itself in the 20th century, and then it did stick, or it has stuck so far. However, during the 19th century, there were a series of modernizers who wanted to see the Islamic world have a renaissance, a renewal. I put the word moder modernizers in quotes, however, because these were not thinkers who embraced modernity per se, um, as I will explain. I've mentioned a few of the more famous ones and the important ones. The man known as Afghani came from uh, uh, Afghanistan. In fact, he studied in uh, the Iranian school that was revolved around Mula Sadra. Uh, he traveled widely, he spent time in Europe, He's very active, very articulate. He was an activist, a cultural advocate. And the core idea that he had was we must, uh, it was, a, it was a, a, a kind of combination of fundamentalism. He wanted to restore I Islam in its original fundamental sense, but he wanted to take on the the means that the, had been developed in the West, the technology, the commerce, the weapons, the, uh, uh, anything that was dealt with the material world was fine, and that took science and reason, but it must operate within and for the purpose of maintaining a strict doctrine of Islam. He uh, hooked up with uh, Muhammad Abdu, a very famous Muslim thinker and uh, intellectual. He was uh, the head of Al Azhar University in Cairo for a time, and he insisted that they reintroduce theology and philosophy. He had not been taught that, it was just law. <clears throat> with Afghani, he published a journal. And but the what they were calling for was to unify, uh, to, to unify Muslims, the Ummah, into this point, to restore the caliphate, 
and to preserve the essential core of uh, the fundamental doctrines. The third thinker I'll mention uh, in the modernizers is Mabidi. He is the, really a 20th century figure. He was a founder of the fundamentalist group uh, uh, in, in India and Pakistan. He was the one who originated a, a term. I've put the Arabic term there because it's um, uh, it really has. It's not easy. There's no direct translation. Uh, it's a it's a term that means Jahiliya refers to the state of polytheism, immorality, uh, degradation that existed in Arabia before Muhammad. It was the mess that Muhammad fixed. What one of the things that the modernizers did, and specifically Mabidi, <clears throat> was to say, well, you know, we we haven't fully escaped this condition just because we now nominally are Muslim. We have really retreated Look at the world around us. People are too materialistic, too selfish, too invested in their secular lives. So the world around us is the world of Jahiliyyah, and we must now do redo what Muhammad did in bringing down the, not literally bringing down the word, there would be no more revelations, but in, in bringing the original revelation to bear on all aspects of society to recreate the world of the rightly guide, guided caliphs who the first caliphs, the companions of, uh, of uh, Muhammad. And embody that in a modern state. We now have states um, as a result of, of the colonial, colonialization by the West, <clears throat> there now existed nations rather than tribes and caliphates and sultans wielding power over larger areas. It was broken up into nation states the way the West was. Uh, that's a fact of life. That's part of modern, uh, one of the modern things we've got, we have to adapt and make use of. But we must now make the state Islamic. And in doing so, Madhuri and others uh, uh, drew on thinkers from the West, their contemporaries, who were no longer by and large Enlightenment thinkers. They drew on Marx, they drew on the, the Counter Reformation thinkers, <clears throat> uh, the, uh, the kinds of thinkers who fed into fascist doctrines. Some of them actually, as you can see here, um, we're perfectly happy with that. <clears throat> it is from this ensemble of ideas, together with Wahhabism, which uh, had uh, was influential not just in Saudi Arabia but in Egypt and um, in Syria as well, that led to the creation of uh, probably the most important single organization that links the ideas with the terrorists that we see around us today, and that is the Muslim Brotherhood. <clears throat> as, I, as I mentioned earlier in the week, the Quran and the sword, the religion and the ideology, the word and the power. This organization was founded in 1929 by an Egyptian school teacher named Hassan Albana. Among uh, Abano absorbed the ideas of the modernizers. <clears throat> In particular, he adopted the idea of heroic death, the heroic death of the Romantic period, and uh, uh, became quite a common theme in German, uh, late 19th century German uh, thought. He sought the creation in Egypt of a single Islamic party. replace the multi-party formal democracy that had existed. <clears throat> 
He was assassinated in 1949. During the 1950s, uh, I think the name Syed, Syed Kuba became the most prominent intellectual and activist spokesman. He was a he, he, he was an Egyptian. He was a um, um, actually a literary thinker and somewhat of a modernist in the full sense. But he was also a Muslim. Uh, and he spent two years in America in the late 40s. And he came back and apparently it was a bad trip because he uh, came back feeling, I have seen Jahiliya. This is awful. Women walking, and this is the 1940s, women walking around uncovered, men and women holding hands, social dances in churches, capitalism, people selfishly pursuing their self interest. And so he was radicalized. Uh, uh, that was the occasion of his radicalization. He wrote a number of works, uh, uh, the, but probably the most famous is one called Milestone in which he laid out his, the agenda of, uh, of what to do about Jahiliya. He expanded and made very, very persuasive this idea of we live in a corrupt world, even in our own lands, and the rest of the world around us is corrupt. The only solution is to bring the religion into the state, into the political power, to give it political power, first in our own countries, and then we must envision it being the true faith. We can expand it. He understood John Haleo now not in the old, original polytheism, uh, you know, belief in idols in the Arabian desert. No, he applied it to modern culture. It is man's subservience to man rather than to God. It is any form of popular sovereignty such as democracy, where people make their own rules rather than using God's rules, a human-centered ethics, like any kind of humanism, worldviews based on science in which God does not play a part. All of this is John he, uh, in doing In doing this, he was obviously, uh, it's not obvious, but it's, um, it, it's true, uh, drawing on critiques of modernity that European thinkers were lodging at this uh, time. And with, we were already in Europe, in America, in the, in the West, into the uh, critique and abandonment and resentment of the Enlightenment and replacing it with postmodern ideas. <clears throat> but he also drew, uh, one of the specific things he drew was the Marxist idea of a vanguard. We have a revolution. This is now an ideology. And the part of the, the concept of ideology in this Marxist form is there's a vanguard who understands and must lead the masses until they're ready to understand themselves. He was enormously important. He was, uh, and I, of the many, many uh, reflections of his importance, um, I was struck by this comment by Ayman al Zawahiri, who is the allegedly number two man in um, Al Qaeda, currently somewhere in the hills of Pakistan. <clears throat> then there is Iran. This is a somewhat different tradition because it drew from Shiite learning. Uh, uh, which had its own school of law, but the schools of law were not that different. We're still talking about the Quran and the Sunnah. Khomeini, uh, the, the revolution in Iran in 1979, was one of the factors that stimulated, made popular, all this uh, agitating that had been done by uh, Hassan al-Banna and their other Muslim brothers, uh, groups there. <clears throat> and what had been a, a relatively, in a sense, marginal movement, I mean, Kupa was executed by the Egyptian government, <clears throat> and the Muslim brothers were constantly being chased by the 
police uh, tortured, uh, banned, and so forth. But this unleashed a, a sense of, of uh, power that carried across the lines of Sunni versus Shiite. Khomeini, though, despite whatever differences there are <coughs> in the sect of his religion, held the essential doctrines that we've been uh, talking about. The laws of Sharia provide for all the, all the needs of man. All the laws and ordinances that man needs to attain happiness and the perfection in this, in his, of his state. Khomeini was a philosopher as well as a legal scholar. Uh, he taught in the universities. He was deeply acquainted with the mystical tradition as well as the legal tradition. <clears throat> and <clears throat> there's no question, I think, that his, uh, his legal and political thinking were rooted in an underlying sense uh, that of the limitations of reason, the errors of reason. and the need for revelation and some kind of mysticism. <clears throat> so, let's catch up with ourselves. <clears throat> for our purposes, on the side of law, the other schools are, they exist, they pertain to many parts of the world, but it was the Hanbalites who were driving um, uh, handling the legal input to the fundamentalists, in particular to Ibn Taymiyyah, <clears throat> Ghazali, uh, the ideas developed, uh, uh, the, the tradition he started, I won't say about the correct syntax, uh, person by person, but the tradition he started was the basis for a mystical tradition Ibn Tamiya was a very important thinker for the Wahhabis. And the Wahhabis and the modernizers were the sources of impact for the Muslim Brotherhood. I should mention that uh, Kupa and also another uh, Muslim brother <clears throat> who had a, a wrote a track that was enormously powerful, went back and uh, sort of rediscovered Ibn Taymiyyah. I mean, he was not a name on everybody's lips in that part of the world, this 14th century, or 13th century um, uh, guy who had just been you know, pumping out these, these obscure criticisms of the, of the syllogism and so forth. But uh, the, his idea about waging jihad against fellow Muslims turned out to be enormously important because now the Muslim Brothers and other groups could say, we can attack the Egyptian government, we can attack the Syrian government. They've gone modern, they've gone secular. They're like the Mongols. And even for me, Who's, I mean, there's no question he was an orthodox Hanbalite school of law guy. He made this argument, and so uh, that we can we can wage uh, jihad against our own society within our own society and not just outside. And so, Ibn Tamir was um, uh, had this flurry of popularity. There were references of it. There were editorials in the Egyptian. Government supported newspapers saying, um, We do not want to teach this guy anymore. Taimiya, <laughs> because uh, they were the object, they were the Mongols. Okay, and finally, the mystical tradition, as well as the whole ambia, the whole uh, 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 tradition of theology and law, were sources for Khomeini. So, 
let us now let me catch up again <clears throat> and draw this to a close. We started out by looking at the doctrines that we observe that are being stated that make up the approach called Islamism about the need to go back to the original ways, to the strict interpretation of the religion, the belief that Islam declined because it lost its fervor, the fervor of true religion, and we must get back to that. The idea that we must incorporate the religion into the modern states that we find ourselves in, and we must exclude Western influence, political, but also cultural, from our society because it is corrupting. <clears throat> this is the situation that we find ourselves in now. I hope that having gone through the, the, the account that I have, you can see some of the background, how this could have happened in the 20th century, now the 21st. Looking at the big picture, it is not terribly surprising that something like this would be inevitable. We here we have a culture which is saturated with God in its art, in its thinking, in its everyday practice. A culture in which the most powerful minds and powerful cultural forces have put reason to the side, have shown it aside the philosophers who were advocates of reason, given voice to the orthodox conformity to law on the one hand and mystical tradition on the other, who have encountered Western culture, discovered that they uh, and the Western world realize that they are way, way behind. They want to catch up, but not at the cost of what defines their, their very being, their identity. I'm surprised some of this didn't happen a lot sooner. In the big picture, I think it's a kind of tragedy. As I was saying yesterday, it is uh, remarkable to see how two cultures, European and Islamic, same intellectual assets in terms of talent and ability and enterprise, with access to the same original sources from Greek philosophers, going through the same issues and wrestling with, with the same issues about how to reconcile secular philosophy with monotheistic religions. One flourished, one declined. The tragedy of the classic age in Islam, <clears throat> I call the spark of reason that didn't catch <clears throat> in the form of, <clears throat> excuse me, thinkers like Avicenna and then especially Averroes. And the great irony here is that the West owes a very significant debt to Averroes as well as uh, the other uh, Muslim thinkers who kept alive some of the text. They were not, I should say, the only um, uh, transmission belt, but they were uh, the one that actually worked, and it meant that the West got those texts at a time when there was a window of opportunity for them to make a difference. The tragedy of the modern age is that when Muslim thinkers were ready to modernize, unwilling as they might have been to challenge their own ideas, as much as they might have wanted to maintain them as the, quote, modernizers, did, still things might have turned out different if they had had, if they were importing from the West good ideas. But by the time they were doing so, the West had already started its own turn, its, turning its back on, on uh, enlightenment and on reason. <clears throat> 
But I don't want to leave you without hope or to paint uh, an entirely gloomy picture. There are thinkers who are uh, in the, this part of the world. There are many thinkers who, and I just, have, I just picked one, an Iranian philosopher named uh, Abdelkarim Sarouche. He was educated in, uh, in Europe in philosophy. After 1979, he returned to Iran and actually served with the Islamic Republic on the steering committee of uh, the Cultural Revolution. But over time, he uh, became a critic, and he's now actually uh, has to be very careful about what he says and does. One of the striking things about him, this is from uh, a talk he gave in Washington not long ago, that summarizes and makes a very interesting point from within his own tradition. <clears throat> Recognizing that, uh, uh, referring back to the two schools of theology, the Asherite and the Pazalite, and the Pazalite, you recall, were the more rational, more humanist ones, and the Asherites were the more fundamentalist, more faith-based, more otherworldly. He is using, as I said many thinkers do, that dispute and the lost tradition of the Metazolites, lost in the sense of an active force but still living in memory, as a point of reference for the true modernists, of which I think he is to an extent, to establish just the principle that rationality independent of religion is acceptable, it is a source, it's safe, it's okay. And it can even identify, be, uh, lead us to identify values that are not dependent on revelation and on received authority. And I'm tickled that he's even calling his next book, Reinventing the Metazolites. <clears throat> Something similar is happening with Averroes. Many thinkers now are trying to recapture him as uh, part of their heritage and use him as a point of reference to protect themselves. You know, I was um, uh, spent a little time in Morocco uh, earlier this year, or in, in the spring, and I, I talked with a philosopher there <clears throat> who is a, he's a historian of philosophy, he specializes in Averroes. And uh, he, he said, one of the reasons I'm doing this is that I need a Muslim thinker. He's an atheist, he's a rationalist. Um, but I need a Muslim thinker that I can make my references to. Uh, philosophy is still actually in, um, uh, not a completely safe thing to be. A philosopher is not a completely safe thing to be in the Muslim world, even apparently in as he westernized a uh, country as Morocco. He said many of his colleagues uh, got threats for what they said in public and even just for being philosophers. Um, so there is a great deal of activity. And uh, I want to close with, with one final image. I found out about this too late to watch this movie, to find it. I didn't know anything about it. But an Egyptian filmmaker, secular uh, filmmaker, has made a film about the story of Averroes, called Destiny in English, I'm not, I'm not sure, which, apparently, which won an award at Can. Has anyone seen this movie? Uh, I'm, I'm going to get my hands on it. But this is the description from Internet Movie Database. And I was, I did come to learn that he did this with a very specific political intellectual agenda, which is Averroes reason, Averroes represents reason against the fundamentalist. These people are fighting. There are people there fighting and trying. And that gives me hope. Uh, about our future, long term to be sure. <clears throat>
challenged uh, running risks. <clears throat> but I believe that uh, uh, there are resources within that civilization and culture that work for the can work for the good. Maybe well, who can predict? Maybe there are things we could do to help. But can work for the good, just as there have been so many factors that work for the bad, as I've tried to explain. Thank you all. I'm, I'd love to take questions. Not to start here, Phil. Um, yes, uh, David. I'm. I'm just curious. Uh, uh, contrast and compare about Al Ghazali. I'm just curious. Uh, he seems to be a very potent thinker, and that seems to be part of what you mentioned. But uh, is he comparable to anybody in the West? Yes. Hume, uh, Descartes, the elements of Descartes. I mean, there's, there's a kind of thinking that is comparable to it. Not the exact argument, and in some cases not quite as deep, but strikingly similar. Um, I think he was, you could say he was a combination of a, a range of skeptical thinkers. But, he, like many religious thinkers uh, in the West as well, the skeptical part, as, as with Pascal, with another analogy, the skeptical attack on the validity of empirical and rational knowledge was in the service of discrediting reason and making room for faith. He didn't go quite as deep or profound as Kant in that respect, but uh, uh, certainly there are other positions. Uh, are the terms um, uh, Mutazilite and Asherite considered contemporary that we might apply to people today, or are they more just a historical arc of development? Uh, if you do a search on Mutazilite in the web, you will find uh, many references in documents, argumentation being raised today. Uh, I'm, next time I, I hope to be able to say a little bit about uh, uh, an Iranian thinker uh, named uh, Alpha Karam Sayyid, who invokes the Metazolites and says, this is the healthy part of our tradition that we must get back to. And Islamists, for their part, uh, invoke Ghazali, they invoke Side, and they invoke uh, Metazolite as we don't want those people around anymore. Even though they aren't. But they, so the, the, the point of reference, it's as a point of reference. Yes, absolutely. Are they you, you cannot underestimate the, 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 the living reality of people's minds of history. Both political history and are they useful categories for us in thinking about contemporary Islamic? No, I don't think so. These are superseded. I mean, you should think in terms of philosophical categories in doctrine. But the issues that they dealt with about free will, knowledge of the moral law, whether by reason or by faith and command, all of those issues are still there. They may not be packaged in exactly the same way as in the past This is an early theological dispute. I mentioned because it, uh, they put those issues on the agenda, and they've stayed on the agenda ever since. And the name has a resonance. Uh, I mean, if you uh, if you go to a school of theology at Al Azhar University in Cairo, or something else, you'll still study Asherite theology. I just say in a long, long tradition of commentators. Okay. Uh, to just underscore some of what you've been saying, uh, there have been a lot of commentaries written on op-ed pages and elsewhere over the last few years uh, contrasting uh, the relative influence of fundamentalism in Western Christianity versus fundamentalism in Islam today. Mm -hmm. And many of many commentators make the point that, well, our situa the situation in the Christian West, quote unquote, is a lot healthier because we went through the, the uh, Reformation. Mm -hmm. And there hasn't been anything comparable in Islam. Well, it sounds like there sort of was, but maybe is the difference that it really got suppressed before it could get established. Um, what's what's the difference there? 
because you've given us the intellectual history that there was right. certainly a real Reformation strand of thinking mm -hmm. uh, in this one, historically. Yeah. Well, let, let, let me actually uh, first clarify a point. I know people often refer to the Reformation uh, as a positive thing in our history and saying you know, Islam should have one or maybe it did and it got lost. Um, I think this is a misnomer. The Reformation in Western intellectual history was the return of fundamentalist Christian dogma in the form of Luther and Calvin who wanted to go back to the early Christian community and the straight text get rid of all this Catholic compromising with the world and, you know, bakshish and uh, 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 accommodation uh, with political power, get rid of all that and go back to uh, uh, the fundamentals. This, so in that sense, what we're seeing today is a reformation in Islam. They're having it right now. What they haven't had fully is the enlightenment, which is <laughs> Except that, as you point out, and now I can get to the substance of your question, they've had many enlightenment. They've had cycles of reformation and enlightenment, fundamentalism and uh, uh, of, of reason or effort to go through. <clears throat> the, unfortunately, the period that I was covering today was really as close to a full enlightenment. I know that ever happened. And uh, um, as I'm going to go into it. In the Islamic world, unlike the West, the balance shifts the other way. David, I have a question about uh, uniformity and, and communications. You, you painted this, this saga, uh, and uh, in addition to the map, you're talking about uh, some people over in Persia and another guy over in Indonesia and whatnot. And to what extent were, were uh, the ideas of the guy in Persia uh, known over in Andalusia and, and vice versa? And uh, were these eruptions of ideas dealt with at the local level, level and then a century later they found out about it in Persia? Or was there some remarkable communication system to the era going on there? Uh, that's a good question, and I, I just don't know enough of the history to answer it very fully. Uh, the, the, the languages of, of Islamic culture at this period were predominantly Persian and Arabic. But because the Quran is in Arabic, and there was enough of the conservative view, it's in, this is the word of God. He was speaking in Arabic. So a lot of people, you, you have to learn Arabic. To do your religion, or at least, uh, you know, not learn it to speak. But so there was um, a lot of communication. But the, it, I don't know what the technology of manuscript production and replication was. This is way before printing. But I do know that Ghazali, Ghazali died in what 1111, um, and Averroes was born a few years later. So within two generations, this work was well known. In his, uh, there was a lot of travel back and forth, and the caliphs um, in the enlightened cities, such as Baghdad at one point, Cordoba, where Averroes lived, spent a lot of money gathering manuscripts for their scholars to work on. I mean, they would send travelers out to go find a copy and come back, you know, two years later. By the yes, about Averroes or any of the other Aristotelian. Uh, Arabic philosophers, are they, um, you said the, many of their works were banned and burned. Uh, do you happen to know if these works, uh, if, if any of them still survive, to what extent do they still survive in the modern day, either in English translation for us Westerners or in the Arab world itself? I mean, are they still widely read? Uh, it's a good question, and I, I, I'm not enough of a scholar or expert to answer it very fully, but I, I, so I'll just tell you what I, what I do know. Um, many of Averroes' works were translated into Latin in the reasons I'm going to talk about. And <clears throat> survived in that form. And the Arabic originals were, were lost. Some were burned, as I said, but you know, uh, lost. Uh, or, and, I mean, they're still, they're still finding Arabic manuscripts. 
Um, but if you look uh, if you look around, you will find um, it, it's hard to find English translations of a lot of the major works um, as uh, of Avicenna. Ghazali's work, The Ignorance of the Philosophers, is available. Actually, there's a new translation. There's an old one on the internet, uh, and a new translation you can get from Amazon. And actually, of all of all the thinkers I've been looking at, um, uh, Amazon seems to have the most extensive list of Ghazali because he wrote tons of mystical, sort of spiritually oriented works, which have been translated, um, you know, as guides to the faith or inspiration. In the way there's tons of, you know, in his Christian bookshop, you know, there's tons of spiritual reflection. Uh, so a lot of this is in, is in English, but certainly you have, you have the hunt for Or it's very old. It's very old. Yes? Um, um, Muhammad was uh, a military leader in addition to a, being mm -hmm. a religious and um, a political leader. And as you noted, within the first hundred years of the founding of Islam, uh, they had. Um, uh, worked their way uh, through military force up to the middle of France. Uh, given this unique history among the major religions of the world, um, is it possible that the barriers to violence in Islam are less or lower than in other religions, given that every major religion has engaged in force? But given this unique history of the founding of the religion, is it possible that Islam is uh, uh, somewhat more prone to the Jihad or force as a method of spreading its uh, beliefs. Okay, good question. I know that's something that um, many people have entertained or wondered about, um, and I guess we can argue about this until the cows come. My view is that yes, uh, that is that is a factor that affected Islamic history and the understanding of the faith. It is a point of reference. But over 14 centuries of Islam, any one point of doctrine or of history, no matter how important the case of, this, of Muhammad is, is going to be subject to widely differing interpretations on the part of thinkers who come after, just as is true in Christianity. So on the one hand, we can say, yes, it's significant that Muhammad was a religious leader and a political leader, as well as the chief source of the religious doctrine. Whereas Jesus was just a source of the religious doctrine. You know, he not only was not a religious leader or a political leader, he was executed as a criminal. Okay, relevant fact. But go forward centuries, go forward, look forward through the history of Christianity and of Islam, and you find periods. Uh, alternating periods, and mixtures of force and peace. Outwardly directed violent jihad in Islam and settled, peaceful, productive eras where, and you find the same thing in Christianity. I don't know if anyone has tried to do a tally, a body count of the two religions, but the body count of Christianity is not insignificant. At about the time we were ended the lecture today, the uh, 11th century, thousands, I think tens of thousands, of people in southern France were wiped out as heretics. The Pope just sort of unleashed the, uh, the Orthodox uh, And we haven't gotten to the Crusades yet. So uh, there's, I, I would hesitate to take any take out any one point like that and attribute too much significance to it, but I have to acknowledge it has some some significance. Uh, Scott, yours will be the last question for today. Okay. Ghazali's ideas seem to have had more traction than Avicenna's, and uh, Averroes' uh, life um, plays out that. Um, why is that? Well, I, I tried to cite the two factors that I, I mentioned, Ghazali's brilliance, just sheer skill as a philosopher, for one 
and the fact that he was prepared to invoke the threat of apostasy and the penalties thereof to explicitly raise the question against himself and, and, and you know, he, he didn't backpedal. So uh, in a culture where these things are, uh, these penalties are real, it's not that hard for philosophers to get a little nervous and scared about, we don't like when people threaten to kill us for our, you know, for what we do. Um, I mean, it's just very distracting. So, <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk a little more uh, in answer to the question next time, um, but not to foreshadow the entire lecture. I'm just going to say I, I think this is a, one of the extraordinary things to my mind about this entire story is that you have two civilizations, Christian and Muslim, both had access at different points in time. Both had access to all the glories of Greek philosophy. Both had a range of brilliant, brilliant thinkers, including some who were committed to reason and some who wanted to reach the same faith. And the balance tipped one way in the West. And that is uh, that, that is why, if you look on the outline, I invoked the, the concept of tragedy. What is this talk? <laughs> Let me That's be a good. pessimist. <clears throat> Wall Street Journal, a few months ago, had an article concerned about the influence of what hobbies in the prisons. And I, in Washington, D.C., you see a lot of black young men, yes, who are involved with the nation of Islam. And every so often, I give myself a thrill and look at final thought. And it depresses me. Uh, I'm fine. I think that there is a great deal of influence among black young men. I, I don't want to... There's their day. I don't want to go, but you don't want to I, go there. That's okay. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and I and I and I'm just very worried about this influence, and I'll leave it at that. Really. What can be done? Well, I, I don't know very much about um, the Nation of Islam, uh, except that I, I, I think there are many Muslims who say this has nothing to do with it. Uh, but on the other hand, it, that aside, there are. Um, I know there is there, there there is some growth in the number of, of Americans who convert to to, to um, uh, Islam. I don't actually know the numbers, but it wouldn't. But the the stereotype is that it's um, there is a uh, a pattern of of blacks doing this. It may well be this is a common hypothesis feeling alienated. From American society, let's adopt an alien religion. But that is really a really dismissive explanation uh, because, uh, I mean, if you're going to have a religion, I, you know, I don't know that Islam is any worse than any other. I mean, if I were choosing a religion, gee, <laughs> it's only it's only one God. Okay, I don't have to worry about you know how does Jesus relate to that? Is he divine or partly human or some combination? There's no concept of original sin. <clears throat> nice, uh, but you know I don't have a dog in this race, so <laughs> uh, so I, I want to kind of avoid that 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 specific point, uh, Chris. But um, I, what I because I think the answer is the problem is religion as such. What is it that leads people to need an authority to be told what to do, to submit themselves to something other than their own reason and aim for something other than their own life and happiness? <clears throat> uh, and that's the that's a pattern in the West. 
I mean, we we should be able to. Um, we do have the cultural resources much more abundantly in a much stronger form to uh, to counter that. So, and so this is illuminating talk. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm following up basically on what you just said, Chris mm -hmm. Benjamin, about sort of starting a, more of a grassroots kind of a campaign. I, in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. I see a lot of women walking around in headscarves. I see a lot of women, well, a few women every once in a while, walking around in chadas, just swathed in mm -hmm. black. I mean, obviously, they don't have to do this. Nobody's going to stone them or beat them in Washington, mm -hmm. D.C. Right. Um, but they've internalized this. Uh, so it's one thing to talk about what mm -hmm. the politicians and the um, sort of lawmakers are, 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 are doing, but it's another thing to talk about what the people actually think themselves. Could you comment on that, on this internalization of this law? Well, uh, to me, um, I mean, first of all, government should have nothing to do with the legal act, but we, you know, we, um, I just, that's a given, and I know it's not, it's not your point. Uh, Secondly, we have to remember that uh, the uh, trend of fundamentalism is worldwide and religion-wide, or at least among the ones that we're concerned with here. The growth of fundamentalism in Christianity and in Judaism is uh, phenomenal over the same time period that we're talking about it um, in uh, Islam, that is mod in its modern form. So, again, the problem is, I think, not Islam per se, but it is, uh, um, uh, you know, it's a matter of religion. I mean, to take the matter of the uh, scarves and uh, other coverings, you know, more Jewish people are wearing the, the cap, more Catholics. Um, are wearing crosses. These are symbols of religious identity. And if you have embraced the religion as part of your identity and you take it seriously in the way that fundamentalists do, it's not that surprising. Uh, I, so actually, I think the, the in, in the West, in our on our street, and to some extent also in Europe, although there's more larger communities are more pressure there. It's not really a matter of law, but of affiliation. Uh, so uh, again, I, I, I would want to get to the, what is it that leads people to want to do that? You know, it is a very different situation from what I understand um, and saw in, in my brief uh, exposure uh, uh, to being in a, in a Muslim country. It's very different from a country where if a woman's not covered, she can be hissed or accosted, where the, the community is enforcing by its sanctions. Sometimes it, it amounts to law, as in Saudi Arabia. Often it's a matter of custom, but strictly enforced custom that makes people fear. That's, I don't think that's what we have here. Yeah. Uh, we've looked a lot at the uh, Intolerance of fundamentalist Islam, where there's really this notion that they literally will not suffer another culture or religion to live. How representative is this view of that of the Muslim on the street, both abroad and in the U.S.? Oh, geez. I, I couldn't. Someone would have to know much more than I do about you know, the sociology and the, or lived there much longer. Right? The problem, I'm sure, that people are this room, right, who have done so and could give a more informative answer. Uh, it's, uh, I think fundamentalists have more power to intimidate people. I, everything I've read and a few things I saw um, uh, suggest that very strongly. More power to intimidate people there, <clears throat> there than here. Unless you're an abortion doctor here. There's not that much ground to fear it, uh, uh, however unpleasant social pressures may be if you happen to live in a community where it's a very strong point. But on the other hand, 
you know, the, uh, in, a, in a lot of uh, cities, we've all seen pictures of downtown cities. Some women are covered, some aren't. Some are, you know, weekly making their way to the mosque, and others are riding motorcycles to work. Uh, the latter is a minority, <laughs> from what I can tell. Uh, so I, I just, I, you'd have to, someone would have to do a study, and I just, I can't tell. I can, uh, it, it's clear that there is a large, larger population of people like that, and uh, large enough for there to be no question in my mind, I don't think anyone else's mind, that it is providing a recruiting ground for terrorism. But um, uh, but also, you know, life goes on in these cities, and people work. And I guess the I, I'm wondering that. around your question. I I realize it's because I'm not sure I know what the question. I, I got in, I got the question there. I was focusing really just on the mm -hmm. element of intolerance, and I was wondering mm -hmm. is that integral to Islam, or is that more a distortion that's held by a very small minority? No, I would say that. I think I'm very safe in saying that what we would call fundamentalist version of Islam, that is strict interpretation of Islamic law and uh, uh, belief, is a bigger percentage of the population than, uh, than in Western countries in general, and probably even uh, than in America, which is, a, for a modern place, is unusually religious. Uh, but much of it is played out in social pressure, and in the case of social pressure, uh, it's sometimes hard to tell how much is religion per se and how much is just social conservatism. You know, it bothers parents when their kids have a baby and it doesn't get baptized. Okay, it, it, baptism is that a strict religious? Well, actually, in Christianity, it is. Uh, bad example. Um, but you know, there are various ceremonies and customs that have built up in a society, sort of attached to religion, but they're, they're really customs of the kind you find in any society, and people start worrying when, other, when they see those customs being broken around them, where I think part of the motivation can be not religion per se, but rather uh, uh, fear that their world is breaking up, that they won't know how to deal with people or something, um, that customs and habits have been broken. And I, yeah, I would have to live inside that culture for a long time to be able to draw that line. But I, so all I'm counting on is uh, the only thing I, I would, I'm standing on <laughs> is that there are thinkers who were pushing people in that direction. They acquired great prominence. <clears throat> They've been very active in the 20th, late 20th century, and people are blowing themselves up in suicide bombings and flying airplanes. I mean, just terrorism is, is uh, clearly religious in, in sort, so it's got to have a wider source in the text. But I can't do numbers, I can only do the qualitative aspect. Yes, I'm sorry to have gone on so long. Yes, uh, <clears throat> I get the impression like people like uh, Leonard Peikoff think that uh, there is a single country or a main country where the bad eye philosophical ideas, Islamic philosophical ideas, mm -hmm. are really coming out for today wherever they came from in ancient times, and uh, they, at least to foment terrorism. And of course, uh, he's saying that country is Iran. And what I wanted to ask you is whether you uh, think there is a kind of a one main country where currently uh, uh, bad philosophical Islamic ideas are coming out of. Uh, and uh, did you imply that perhaps maybe Khomeini was one of the major sources in, in your slide there? Uh, right there. Uh, yeah. um, no, let me let me take this that your question in pieces. Um, I, I, I'm not. I can't speak for people. It's been a long time since um, yeah, I, was just I had a chance to. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, I, I do think that the but who, where's who's ever view it may or may not be. I don't. I don't think it. Coming out of one country, because at any point in time, there there are different centers. Egypt was a very important center during the period that I was talking about. Um, 
Uh, Iran is very important now because of having gained control of, a, of an entire country, they have the resources to fund a lot of Islamist terrorism, fund you know, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, all those, all those groups. Uh, but that's, that, that's, that's the mechanics of it. The ideas that are fueling this are culture-wide. Um, and in some ways, you know, I mean, if people like Sarouk are living and working in Iran, engaging in philosophical thought, I'm not sure that the situation there, I mean, it looks awful from my standpoint, and it is awful by rational modern standards, but I'm not sure it's worse than the situation that Arouk was working in. I mean, he had a caliph who had total power, who was, you know, strict on the religion. Averroes himself thought only a few people, like himself, should be allowed to engage in philosophy. It was too dangerous for the masses. They should go with the Quran. Um, so there were universities and then the largest. And this is, this is the way things work for long periods of time. So uh, in one sense, maybe there's enough room there for at least some intellectuals to get traction. Uh, anyway. Uh, to me, it has the smell of a conspiracy, of conspiracy thinking, to think that we can trace all this stuff back to one factor that we could then put our pants on, or bomb. <laughs> I'm not against bombing, but that won't get rid of the idea. Yes, first. Uh, David, uh, first of all, great set of uh, talks. One of the things that's uh, struck me about um, the fundamentalist uh, Islam is uh, Muslims is the strict, strong puritanical strain, particularly with regard to the consumption of alcohol, sex, and the uh, suppression of women. But of course, I know that's been uh, been true in a lot of other uh, fundamentalist uh, uh, religions, or fundamentalist aspects of other religions. But my question is: is this as you take a look at that, that, that puritanical strain, is it more intense, or does it seem to be more intense in uh, <coughs> Islam? And are there roots in the Quran that uh, make it a, a more important aspect of Islam than might have been the case with, let's say, Jewish fundamentalists, Christian fundamentalists, and, and so forth? I don't know of any. That is, I don't, again, let me check and make sure I understand your question. Are, are you saying, are there roots in the nature of a religion yes, that, that make the fundamentalism more puritanical, more puritanical, particularly with regard to sex and alcohol, and presumably drugs. Well, the Quran does say, um, no sex outside marriage. You're whipped if you, uh, if you have it and you're not married, and you're stoned to death if you're an adulterer. <clears throat> That's been known to happen in other religions. Uh, remember, the, remember the Scarlet Letter? Oh, yeah. Uh, and uh, no drinking. And that's actually the, the, the Quranic injunction against it is you're not supposed to come before Allah drunk. It's disrespectful. Um, but it was kind of extended. Mm -hmm. And apparently there was a lot of drinking in Mecca before. <laughs> um, as maybe there was in Salt Lake City before the Mormons arrived. Thank you. Uh, and for that matter, I can't help uh, uh, invoking, a, a, a remaking a point I made earlier in the week in a totally different context. I'm not sure the strain of Puritanism, uh, leaving aside the, the one thing I feel. But I'm not sure the strain of everyday practice fundamentalism um, is worse than, say, the Puritanism of the politically correct who don't want us to buy things that we want, don't want us to cut down forests, uh, want us to limit our fuel emissions and so forth. I mean, Puritanism is a, a, is a pretty healthy strain in human nature, um, which is capped by a lot of different ideas. How are we doing? Okay. Good. Our leaders tell us that we're at war against terrorism, but Aren't we really, should, aren't we really at war against some sort of, some aspect of fundamentalist Islam? You know, but 
Are we at war against all aspects of fundamentalist mm -hmm. Islam? Is you know, are there certain aspects of it that that we can live with? Well, I think we can live with any of it uh, as long as they don't kill us. I mean, that would make a big difference. Uh, you know, that's that's a little. Um, a little too quick with the issue because, uh, you know, I wrote a book about benevolence, uh, the point of which was interactions with people should be based not just on judgment, and I say include the people who don't want to deal with, but also on uh, the entrepreneurial effort to build relationships that can be valuable. Uh, I think. We have a, you know, we're, we're operating at a great loss in a sense from uh, a society in which intelligence has been so hampered that they're not creating what they could be creating and trading with us. So uh, I do think we have a longer term interest, uh, not something the government can do except by way of getting, getting rid of the trade barriers, getting out of the way of trade, which is leaving this a private thing. Uh, I think we have you know, a lot to do in that way. Um, and intellectual exchange and, and so forth. So there's a positive incentive here. But if if it weren't for the you know uh, political conflicts and the terrorist threat, <clears throat> I, I don't think I, I don't think we would we would have a, a government political issue, a U.S. government political issue. And I say that knowing that. I, you know, I do hold our, our government. I think it's made mistakes and it's accountable. As I said at the very beginning of this series of lectures yesterday, there is a political factor here, tremendous resentment, um, uh, some of it unjustified, but some of it at least, let me put it this way, understandable. I think if I were in their shoes, I might, I might feel somewhat uh, a piece of it. So, but the point is, uh, if it weren't for that issue, we would have a lot less to worry about and the, the government would have nothing. I'm wondering whether over the course of the next uh, 50 years we're overlooking something we should worry about, <clears throat> I don't know, as much or more than terrorism, but it's the spread of their ideas. I mean, it strikes me the utter consistency of these ideas. They're far more fundamentalist than the fundamentalists. The West is not in confident area about reason now. Um, you know, could, Thank could you, there are... That was the piece of the answer I forgot. I knew. I knew I'd, I'd faded out on some important point. <clears throat> the war on terror is genuinely a, a war and it's against terrorism. But because we understand that it has cultural roots, it is also a war of ideas, metaphorically speaking. Uh, a war, but that gets us into the area where tremendous clarity, philosophical clarity is needed. State Department has issued a document, uh, a, a broad policy um, statement to the effect that we are engaged in a war of ideas. Well, I wish they knew fully what ideas they were on the side of. <clears throat> because, because you can't get it very far into this without asking some questions about relying on faith rather than reason. A submission to a moral code that comes to you by law rather than by you know, reasoning your life in this world. Uh, but obviously, to raise those questions means, um, as what from the statement of the Pogo cartoon, uh, and no, I'm sorry, it goes back to I forgot what I'm thinking of. We've met the enemy and he is, he is us. I mean, this is an intra cultural war. The war of ideas is intercultural. It's our pre-modern fundamentalists and our postmodern relativists and skeptics and destroyers of capitalism against us good guys. And in every other civilization, but specifically in Islam, it's the bad guys against what good guys there are. Uh, and that's the battle that has to be fought in, in ideas. And, and just 
um, uh, hope that over the next 50 years, to go back to uh, Phil, uh, that we can we can have the kind of impact with with a rational philosophy to convey that understanding more broadly. But of course, that would mean massive changes to our own culture. And that's what we're all about. Thank you for coming. Uh, <laughs>